this portion is diseases of goats. We also cover vaccinology or vaccine uh, recommendations. If you get four veterinarians up here and ask us how to, how to vaccinate a goat, you're going to get four different answers. Not everybody's going to do everything the same way. But then again, not everybody in this room needs to do the same thing the same way. Your probably greatest resource is a local practicing veterinarian within 50 miles of your house. Because they can tell you what diseases are prevalent, what problems you're going to have in your forage, if you're selenium and vitamin E deficient in your area, if your soils are vitamin E deficient, if you're having problems. And when you do have a problem, rather than choose a drug to treat pink eye and lose a lot of time and maybe an eye and some money. If you talk to your local practicing veterinarian, he's seen it in three other goat herds last week and he can save you time and money on everything. So they're, they're your best resource for, for the dewormers to use, and how often to use them, uh, vaccines that you can use. Uh, the good thing about goats, and I set it out in the barn yesterday, is we haven't been raising them long enough to screw them up yet. They're a pretty resilient animal, they're hardy, and usually with just a little bit of change in management or medication, they respond quite well. So uh, we're going to talk about, oh, eight or ten diseases here, but um, probably you're not going to see all of them. However, if you do, um, You'll, you'll have had some exposure to them. There's two or three of these that are cosmopolitan or they're everywhere. They're in dirt. So if you've got goats and they're on dirt, you're gonna, have, you're gonna be exposed to these clostridial organisms and you're gonna need to have vaccine for that. Um, when we talk about management and band-aids, you know, when my kids fall down and they have, mom's gotta give them a band-aid, it really doesn't fix anything. It just makes them feel better for a little while. And so when we're treating these animals, if we've got conditions and we're seeing it, probably what we need to do is go back and look at our vaccine regimen or look at the way you're managing things and, and change that up. I, I, talk, I give the same presentation to cattle producers and I talk to them about um, buying vaccine is like buying insurance. You know, some people need a whole lot of insurance. They're poor managers. Um, they've got operations that are kind of fly by night, so you need all the vaccine, you need all the insurance you can get. Other people get by on a very minimal amount of vaccine and things just because they're just really good managers. These are just some signs, what you see usually when we have sick goats or if we have a disease process starting. And a lot of times, the first thing you see is just they're slow to, excuse me, they're slow to come up. It'll be, you know, everybody comes in and I got one doe that's dragging back and she's not coming in. Or they are all coming in and there's a kid down there by the pond under the tree and he's not coming up with the rest of the bunch. Sometimes that's the first thing you see. Then when you start looking, you, you might identify other things like, well, you know, we've got a little diarrhea. Um, he's breathing hard. Now I see another goat that's up here and it's coughing. So these are just a lot of the things that we see in goats that give us a clue that something may be going on. This is going to be what we try and cover today. And we're going to go over it pretty fast. And then you guys ask questions. If you've seen this, if you've had this problem, uh, you know, let us know. And if you've got treatments or control methods that you use at home that works great because your 80-year-old neighbor that's been raising goats for 50 years told you, please share that information with the rest of us because there's some anecdotal treatments out there that do work pretty good. We're going to talk about these first two together, overeating disease and tetanus. The reason is because they're both caused by a clostridial organism, and anywhere there's dirt, you've got clostridial organisms. You know, grandma, your grandma knew, if you step on a rusty nail, you go get a tetanus shot. And basically that's because anytime you have a puncture wound without oxygen and there's any kind of dirt around, you're going to have this organism, clostridial tetani, is going to be there. And so sheep and goats, if we rank all the animals on susceptibility, people are on top, horses are next, and then sheep and goats are right below that. Some of our species, like dogs, you just can't hardly get them to get tetanus. And other animals are real sensitive. And sheep and goats are one of those that, that are. So we, um, we need some tetanus, need it on hand. Like I said, these two, we're going to talk about them together because they're kind of like cousins. They're both the same organism. And the other reason is because they both come in the same bottle of vaccine. Now, for a lot of people in this room, and especially meat goat operations, this is the first and only vaccine you're going to use. Just because it has 
overeating disease, which is Clostridial perfringes. If there's anybody in here that's ha been in the cattle business, you know what black leg is. You know, the fastest, best doing, growing as a calf out there. You see him one night and the next morning you pull in the pasture and he's laying there dead. You never saw him sick. He was the best guy and, it, and it's not, it's not wrong to, to say, man, he was the best calf in the pasture because it's usually your fastest growing animal that does that. This is the very same thing, overeating disease, Clostridial provenges type C, except it happens in sheep and goats. The reason they call it overeating disease is because a lot of times we'd see it when we'd take those lambs or those goats and wean them and put them on feed. And they would start eating feed and then their growth would would increase so much that that's when they'd get this clostridial infection and go ahead and die. So you, uh, you see the very same thing. Uh, a lot of times all you see is sudden death. You just see great doing buck, biggest buck kid in the pasture and he was jumping around running acting ornery last night and this morning you pull in there and he's dead. And of course uh, signs of tetanus um, most everybody knows you see joint stiffness, you see muscle pain, they'll be acting like they're walking on their toes kind of humped up if you get to see clinical signs and then shortly after that they're going to lock up in a sawhorse stance and be laying on their side. Usually their head pulls back and then the paralysis even paralyzes the, the diaphragm, they can't breathe and they die. So the main thing is we don't try and treat either one of these because usually you don't have a chance to. We vaccinate to prevent it. And the vaccine, I usually bring a bottle with me. I will out at the ranch for tomorrow afternoon, but it's, it's very inexpensive. It costs about 30 to 50 dollars, or 30 to 50 cents a dose. Um, it's very antigenic, and it comes in 10 to 50 dose bottles. Uh, it's the one thing everybody have, ought to have in the fridge, out there in the barn or at the house. What's the dosage on it? Uh, sheep and goats, I think it's a two cc dose. And it includes for kids? It's yes, sir. Kids. Yeah, per, per animal. And like I said, uh, that's on the kids. We usually vaccinate them at about three months whenever you're going to wean them because that's when they're going to be started on feed and that's when they need this vaccine. In the bucks and does in your herd vaccination program, that's one of those vaccines that we would like to ideally give about four to six weeks before they're going to start kidding. If you're going to kid in the spring, in February and March, when all the kids are home for Christmas, you, you get a couple of those big strong boys and you, everybody goes out there and we vaccinate all the goats. Yes, ma'am. Why four to six weeks before kidding? Um, if we will vaccinate these animals four to six weeks before kidding, that, you, that doe will mount an immune response. She'll get real high blood antibodies and then the colostrum is a filtrate of the blood and she'll, she'll make that colostrum and have super high levels of those antibodies in that colostrum. And that's better than anything you can buy in a store. It's mother nature's way of uh, really supercharging colostrum. So if you'll do that, not only will it protect that doe, but she's going to have the, the greatest colostrum for those kids when she, uh, when she kids. So how often would you do this? Once a year. Just once a year. How often can you do it? How often could you do it? We had that question yesterday. Somebody purchased some goats. They don't know if they've had that shot in the past. Don't worry about it. Just go ahead and give it again. So put on, put them on schedule once you get it. If you can. Uh, the best way to do this, I, I was telling the lady that asked me yesterday because she said, well, we vaccinated them in July and now here we are. Uh, we're going to kid in, in February and March. How should I do this? I said, just get them all back up and give them another dose, regardless if they've had it or haven't had it. It won't hurt them. But if you'll give it four to six weeks before kidding, you're going to have some super high colostrum and you're going to have great luck. How's uh, that apply? Pardon? How's that apply? It's an injectable product. You, you give a shot, sub-Q or IM, but sub-Q would probably be the preferred route. Is it just one dose or do you have to do it one then? The question is, is, is there one dose or is it a booster? Uh, if you read on the bottle, it'll say give a booster dose in two to four weeks or three to six weeks. However, uh, in practice, not many people booster it because clostridial vaccines are so antigenic, one dose will do it. 
and the other thing is, is most of the time you're going to, now if I were going to keep some does, I would probably go ahead and booster it a little later. The other thing is, is that you don't need to booster it if they've ever had it before. So on your adult herd that you're giving it to once a year, out there four to six weeks before kidding, they only need one dose a year. Yes, sir. This CDT includes tetanus. Uh, what about uh, an animal that gets you know, stuck with a nail or something later on. Is there another tetanus shot that we should give them like I do my horse? Okay, I guess we should address that now. There's two kinds of tetanus. You got tetanus toxoid, like this. When you give this vaccine, it's gonna take about seven to 10 days before it becomes effective, and it'll last you a year or longer. And then you have tetanus anatoxin. Tetanus anatoxin is immediately protective soon as it comes out of that syringe but it only lasts for about two weeks and then it runs out so if you have an animal of unknown vaccination history let's say you buy some doe kids they're six months old you unload them out of the trailer and she cuts her shoulder or something like that well i don't know if this doe ever had any vaccine i don't know if the guy that owned her before me but we sure need to do something right now you would give her the anatoxin and probably what i'd do is give them both at the same time and that way in two weeks when your anatoxin runs out this this one's had a chance to uh, build that immunity did i answer your question but if you have one that you've been you know that's already got this dosage and she gets hurt later on you don't have to do that. No, if, if they've had this for a week and something happens, you don't need to be given anything else. Okay. Where I give in a toxin in practice is those people that bring me those little kid goats that are about a month old and they want them debutted and they want a band put on their testicles because they're fixing to be a pet in the backyard or something and hadn't had anything. Because in practice, every goat I saw that died of tetanus that they brought in and sat down in front of me because it's locked up like a sawhorse. They had a little ring around the horns or they had a band on their testicles, every single one of them. So um, that, that's where I used antitoxin in practice because those does hadn't been vaccinated prior to that. All right, any other thing about tetanus before we go on? Talk about sore mouth. Who in here has had goats with sore mouth? Okay, the rest of you are going to have goats with sore mouth. It's just a matter of time. This is kind of like uh, chicken pox in kids. And it is actually a, a, a parapox virus. Uh, what you'll see is you'll see a goat. You'll go to the sale barn. Or no, you don't go to the sale barn. You're going to go to a sale uh, after a buck test. And you're going to buy a kid. And you're going to bring it home. And then all of a sudden, about four weeks later, you're going to see a little scab right here in the corner of their mouth. And not only on the one you bought, but now it's on five that you have. And that's, that's sore mouth. It's a little scab right here in the corner of their mouth. Now, if they get it like that, it's not a big deal because they're going to get it and get over it just like chicken pox. And those animals are going to be really, really have a high level of immunity and they won't get it again. Where, where sore mouth is a problem is if you got a bunch of three week old kids and those does get it on their teats. And every time those kids go to nurse, it hurts and she kicks him off. Or those kids get it on their mouth and they get it all over and their mouth's so sore they won't nurse and they'll just lay down and starve. So having sore mouth on your, pro on your place isn't a bad deal. It's like taking your kids down the street to play with the girl in summer that has chicken pox like my mom used to do. Everybody in town went over to somebody's house if they had chicken pox. So that's kind of what happens here. The only reason we talk about this much, you say, well, if it doesn't cause a problem, uh, why, why are we talking about this? Because it is actually zoonotic. People can get this. That's what they told me in vet school. I've never seen anybody ever have sore mouth until the last goat boot camp and a lady raised her hand and said I had it. I said then stand up and tell everybody in this room what it looks like because I have no clue. And she said it looked like a spider bite on the end of her finger. A boil came up and it turned black. And she said she went to her human physician twice and he said oh yeah that looks like a spider bite or something. She said she was in there with her veterinarian asking her what the scab was on that goat's mouth and he said well that's uh, sore mouth and that's what you've got on your hand too. And so um, Anyway, uh, it went away, 
uh, they treated it. She said he gave, the vet gave her some kind of cream and put it on there and it all went away. So uh, It doesn't really cause a problem in people and that's the only person I've ever heard in 20 something years of practice that had it. But if you see goats that have that scab right here and you've got some little kids or something, you know, just little kids meaning children, uh, you just want to kind of keep them away or at least have them wash up good after they do uh, handle those goats. The thing about the scabs are they'll lay in the ground for years and they're infective. This, this thing's kind of just there. But the only time it's a problem is when you have some little kids, kid goats, that are very young and nursing and they get it in their mouth and quit nursing or those does will actually get it right on their teats and when those kids go to nurse it hurts so they'll start kicking them off. So we can see some kid starvation if you get this right when you have newborns. Anybody in here seen this? What did it look like? Yeah, on, on ours it looked blistery all over their uh, and the blisters, once they pop, then it turns to a scab. Exactly. It kind of like you getting a fever blister. Yeah, yeah. and it, it kind of corrects itself over two to three weeks, something like that. And it, you can treat it by putting uh, some sort of uh, solution on their mouth, but we didn't because it was infected, you know, so, so infectious. Mm -hmm. And it just cleared up by itself. Yeah. We never had any trouble with feeding problems or anything like that. Did you ever have any little bitty ones get it? Or were they bigger? Okay. The little bitty didn't get it, I don't believe. I don't remember for sure. Okay. But it did look not just a scab here, it looked blistering all the time. There is a vaccine for this. Colorado Serum makes it. Uh, however, they only sell it to veterinarians because if you basically using the vaccine, you go in there and vaccinate your goats and you give them sore mouth in the season to where they don't have little bitty kids nursing. That's all you're doing. This is a live vaccine, and if you scratch you with it while you're doing it, you're going to get it. So because it's uh, zoonotic, they only sell it to veterinarians, and really all you're doing is giving this to your herd at the time of the year when you don't have little new kids nursing. All right. We're going on to, to CL, Casea lymphadenitis. Uh, this is caused by a bacterium organism right here. And how many people have seen this? It's the golf ball size knot right here around the throat or in front of the shoulder. Okay. And the ones that haven't, you're going to see it. So uh, it's, it's just kind of around. Um, you kind of manage this. The nice thing about meat goats is that you can treat it to get rid of the visual sign and the, the lesion, and then you can market that animal. It doesn't affect the, the slaughter value or the marketability or eatability of that animal. The real problem with this thing is you can treat those abscesses, and sometimes they'll just keep coming back. You'll treat a doe, and six months later, she's got another one, one on the other side. You treat that. You lance it, flush it with iodine, it goes away, she heals up and looks beautiful, and then all of a sudden one pops up on the shoulder. It goes to major lymph nodes, and that's where it's going to abscess. And typically it's the ones around the neck and the head um, and in front of the shoulders. Can I offer a, 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 a possible different way of handling it? Yes, sir. I have not used it. I've had it, obviously, but one of my friends, he uh, takes a 20cc syringe, drains it, like a 3 through 3 spot, and then uses a uh, formaldehyde. Uh. I've heard that uh, that's a kind of a time-honored treatment. The only problem with that is formaldehyde is a off-label, you know, use in a meat animal. So uh, formaldehyde is also a carcinogen. That's why they don't let you buy it at Walgreens. And so, um, but I know a lot of guys that will take iodine or formaldehyde and inject right into those abscesses, and it will take care of that. As far as uh, a lot of people will actually do the very same type of procedure and they'll flush it with iodine and, um, and that, that seems to work good also. Um, I like to open them up, not just with a needle, but I like to just take a scalpel blade. Uh, they'll be the size of a golf ball. It'll be full of a yellow to white cream cheese looking stuff and usually it has no odor. That's the thing. Now you can get other crony bacterium uh, things that um, cause abscesses. This isn't the only thing. Just because you see an abscess on a goat, it doesn't mean you have CL. But um, a lot of times it is. And when you 
when you do have CL uh, right here, we can we can get rid of the, the, the abscess that's on there, but it may come back somewhere else in another lymph node. And so a lot of times if you'll cull that affected animal, you can get rid of your problem. When you have, where you're in a bind is, I had some ladies, clients of mine that had goat dairy. Uh, and these, they sold the doe kids for 1200 a piece when they were born, you know, because they milked, set some third greatest milking record in the nation or something. So when you have genetics that are that way, what we would do, they would do, and they had a lot of CL positive does, is when those kids were born, they'd never let them nurse, and they pasteurized the colostrum and fed them that way, and then those does, we would, test them and they would be negative, the kids out of those positive does. But that's a lot of pain and a lot of hassles to go to, especially if you're in a meat goat operation. Um, treat the animal, get rid of the lesion to where they look good enough to market, and then send them to town sometime. Is that something where we can do it out on our farm or should we take that to a vet? Well, this will just be an abscess, about the size of a golf ball. And some people are very competent and as good as I am at being able to just open those up. Uh, if you put a needle in that and pull back and it's just pus, then you know you can open it up and you can flush it with iodine or you can use the formaldehyde method and, and take care of that yourself. Now, I've seen them do it on a horse. Mm -hmm. um, they actually opened it up and took a water hose and just sprayed it into the horse. And cleaned it out. Flushing out those abscesses is great. The only problem with this is, guys, when you do this, get you a feed sack, clean it out, flush it with iodine, take that, water it up, take it to town, throw it in the dumpster. Because this this is extreme, this organism will live in the ground a long time. So you don't want to just take the water hose and spray it all over your place. Well, it was, they did it at the vet and it was going down into the Oh, place, okay. So. Okay. But that was something that I was wondering if that could be done on on your land or not? You, you can. Yes, ma'am. You can do it there. How long? Yeah. Oh, go ahead, ma'am. Um, it wouldn't be a bad idea to isolate it. Usually, if you get it opened up and flushed with iodine, you've killed all the organisms there, and now we're allowing it to heal. But to isolate one after you open it from the rest of your herd would probably be a good idea. Especially you're in the dairy business, right? Yes. Yes, sir. Is there a time uh, limit if you if you treat it with iodine, clean it up, treat it with iodine before the animal can be processed? In other words, before you a withdrawal time. Yeah. Uh, topical iodine doesn't have a withdrawal time, and that's why I like that product um, over some of the others. Um, now, if you gave it a little LA 200 or a shot of penicillin at the same time which could be justified to leave this let this heal up for 30 45 days to where they're smooth and good looking enough to sell as a meat goat then I think the withdrawal time on LA 200 is 45 days so if you use an injectable product those have withdrawal times most topical things don't have a withdrawal time because they don't go systemic because we've actually seen this on a couple of our goats I mean, we thought they were just spider bites because I mean, they the with them ramming each other and stuff, they eventually eventually does break open mm -hmm. and drains out. Um, but I, I had because I would think a spider bite would look the same, or because we do have a lot of spiders on our property. <laughs> well, it seemed to come after vaccination. Okay, there there is a vaccine for this, and Colorado Serum makes it, but it's not labeled for goats. It's made for sheep, and it says. It's supposed to aid in the prevention. Well, if your goats don't have a knot on them now, if you use this vaccine, they all will. Because we used it in that goat dairy to clear it up and every single one of them got a knot right where I gave this. It's, it's pretty reactive, uh, this vaccine. It causes severe reaction in goats. Now, Dr. Sparks was telling me that they have a new vaccine. It's manufactured in Texas and it has conditional approval. It's not an FDA approved one yet, but the state veterinarian has to sign off on it. And he said Texas, Oklahoma and nine southern states have a conditional license to use this new vaccine for goats that's uh, CL. The only people I would recommend this to is the lady back here that's got dairy goats or if you're a seed stock producer that has extremely valuable genetics because if you're a meat goat person you want to take care of the, the lesion and then get them to town. All right we're gonna go on. Urinary calculi. 
Uh, this is what everybody calls a kidney stone. What you typically see is you go out there and there's a nine month old buck and he's screaming. You think, oh, he must be hung in the fence. You go out there and he looks like a sawhorse on the ground. He's camped out like this and he's dripping urine from his, from his prepuce. He's got a, a urinary calculi, which is a, a mineral deposit. It's just like a, a human person getting a kidney stone and he's got it in his urethra and his penis and he's trying to pee and he can't. He's a, just like your, he's, he's plugged up. Uh, at that point in time, in practice, there is a surgery to where you can go in and reroute uh, males to be able to urinate out underneath their tail and that sort of thing. Guys, this is just a salvage surgery for a pet. If this is a breeding animal, a buck, well he's not ever going to be able to breed once we do that surgery. Uh, the other thing is it's not a long lasting surgery. In a couple of years it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a problem. So the best thing to do if you see this, because now you have no options, you walk out there and this, this buck, he's, he's sitting there like this and, and he's dripping urine and he's screaming, is pick up the phone and call somebody in town that wants a weekend barbecue goat right then. Because the second you stick a needle in him with penicillin, with Dex, with anything, you've got 30, 45 day withdrawal before you can eat him. You've just run him as a, as a barbecue goat. But when he's affected, you can just right then, he's, he's good to go to eat. Now treating them, uh, some people do want to treat them and uh, like I said, when I was in practice I did surgery on some of them and they just thought that that was the greatest thing because now he's back on the back porch tomorrow and everything, all the kids are happy. The other thing is figuring out what's go why this is happening. This is one of those deals that if you have it happen, you need to start thinking, okay, I got two more out here that are fixing to do this and there's something wrong with my calcium phosphorus ratio in my feeds. I'm feeding cattle feed or most of the time, every time I saw it, they were eating dog food. Every single time. They're eating dog food. They're either a backyard pet or they, you got the goat that's figured out how to jump over in there in the Great Pyrenees and eat his dog food once he leaves. Because dog food has a calcium phosphorus ratio that's way off the charts as far as goats are concerned. The other thing that you'll see, and then you'll probably hear this in the nutrition deal, is feeding commodity feeds. Um, these. Um, corn gluten feed, uh, brewers feed, sunflower pellets, all these commodity feeds that we're feeding um, cattle now, a lot of them have some really high phosphorus and some weird ratios. So just make sure you're feeding goats goat feed and you'll be okay on this. The other thing is we see this a lot in the show goat business because we're given all these crazy supplements. You know, we've got goat grow, goat bloom, winter's edge, and we get them on a scoop of everything and we put it in a bucket of grain and we hang it in front of them two times a day. They're in a little bitty pen, they don't get much exercise and get way too much grain. Uh, you won't see this in a meat goat operation very much because meat goats are gonna be out on pasture, not eating a lot of grain, and because we're not gonna have all these weird calcium phosphorus imbalances that we see when they're eating dog food, distillers grains, or if you've got that boar show goat that you've got in the pen and you're hanging big buckets of feed with supplements in front of it every day. So it's the phosphorus that causes the problem, not calcium? That's correct. Well, you can have two different types of crystals. You can have a calcium oxalate or a urate, but usually it's the calcium oxalate. But the main thing is salvage the animal, Pick up the phone call and call your buddy that's wanting a barbecue goat or, or somebody if you've got an uh, ethnic group in your town that loves to eat goat, then just pick up the phone and get him sold right then. Uh, treatment's not usually very rewarding, but then look into your, your management and figure out why your goats are getting this. And like I said, in practice, every single time they were eating dog food. So Why the distillers? Why the distillers grains? Because these grains... Because Dave, why do the, the byproduct feeds have such weird phosphorus and calcium problems? Well, because grains are high in phosphorus to start with, real time, all the grains are high in phosphorus. Refuges are high in calcium. And then if you take, uh, anytime that you take a grain and take part of it out, 
it seems like uh, the cap, a big part of the calcium goes with the part they remove. The phosphorus tends to stay there in the byproduct. And then the other thing is uh, a lot of these, uh, they use phosphoric acid and in the process of uh, uh, trying to get out the, the oils or whatever part they're trying to get out. And if they leave just a little trace of that, if it's not recovered, then that really helps the phosphorus. So that, and also, if, if you go buy a sack of feed, that tag, it has to have a tag that tells you uh, what those uh, levels are. And byproduct feed, there's no control, and you may get you may get two or three loads that are okay, and then all of a sudden you get in load that for whatever reason is really high and it catches you by surprise. I know when they when they make um, ethanol, they use a phosphoric acid wash on that corn to, to dissolve off that outer layer and expose that um, carbohydrate so they can ferment it and make ethanol for for cars or drinking or whatever they make ethanol for. So, so when you look when you look on your uh, tag on your feed, uh, you, you're looking for uh, about the same amount of calcium as there is phosphorus in your feed. You'd like a one to one or two to one calcium phosphorus. You want more calcium usually than you want phosphorus or, or the same. And if you buy a livestock feed, they've got a nutritionist that's going to make sure it's that way. When you buy a load of corn gluten meal, uh, those, those loads, there's no requirement and sometimes you'll get one that has a low, sometimes it's high. Yeah, if you, like I live real close to a, uh, a place where they have a lot of that uh, distiller's grain. Can you buy a load of that and take and get it analyzed? Oh, all you have to do is just get a sample, take it to your county extension agent, they'll run it in and get a nutrient analysis done on it and you can tell what's in it. And if it had a lot of phosphorus, what could you do to it? Well, then you get then you balance it out with other products such that you can get your calcium phosphorus ratio correct. All right, we're going to go on talk about contagious foot rot. Anybody in here had much problem with this? Hopefully you won't. Up in the the mountains and when you get into Wyoming and Montana they run a lot of those sheep up in the mountains in the summertime and down in Australia they see some problems with this especially in countries like New Zealand where you have lots of wet lush area and it stays muddy nine ten months out of the year uh, once you get this going in a herd it can be very contagious it can affect a lot of them and we talked about how when we trim our tissue on the feet we cut off all the necrotic tissue until you get some some pink or bleeding tissue and then also how we can use uh, a foot bath with copper sulfate and you can treat you know the whole herd just by running them through this. Uh, usually around here and in practice when somebody had this you could just treat the individual animals. You could use some antibiotics this clears up. This is the same organism that causes foot rot in cattle. Um, you can use a little LA200 or some of those things and, and it kills this organism pretty good. And Dr. Sparks talked about how uh, there's compounds. Um, Dr. Nallers uh, you know something in heel and probably it's got a lot of formaldehyde in it because uh, painting this on that painting the outside of the foot with some formaldehyde or some iodine goes a long ways in clearing this up too. There is a vaccine out there it's made for cattle and there's kind of mixed reviews on it some people thinks it works some people don't I think the reason is because uh, it doesn't give long-lasting immunity the vaccine so um, I haven't heard anybody using it in, in sheep but or goats, but there is a vaccine out there. Probably one of those things you want to talk to your local veterinarian about before you jump off and go to vaccinating everything for foot rot. White muscle disease. Who's seen this and their kids? Okay. Anybody? Well, that's great. There are parts of the country in the United States that have selenium deficient soils and that means your grass is going to be selenium if it's growing there and that means your hay is going to be selenium deficient and those areas uh, usually if you'll talk to your veterinarian he'll say yeah we got an area out here on the other side of uh, the lake or so that we have some problems over the years this can be given 
Uh, there's a supplement it's called um, BOC or EC, MUC. It's an injectable product. And the herds that I saw problems with, you just have them give the, an injection of this to those bred does four to six weeks before kidding, just like you do your CDNT vaccine. What you typically see is you see kids that are born and they look great and they got their ears up and they're bleating and they're hungry. They just can't stand up. You pick them up, put them over there and they'll just nurse like crazy and you set them down and they just hit the ground. And if you cut those open after they die, they have these real pale muscles and they just can't stand up. Now if you uh, use the same vitamin E selenium and you give those kids and you, you make sure they get over there and nurse for two or three days, three times a day, then a lot of times they'll get to where they can stand up. Where I saw this in practice was where a doe laid down and had triplets or quads and she got two of them up and walked off and left one and you, you call up you know the 4-H girl that lives down the road and you say hey you want a baby goat and they say oh yeah and they feed a milk replacer that doesn't have much of this in there and then those kids get to where and they'll, they'll call you up and say doc I, I got this baby goat you know the mom walked off and left it my daughter's been feeding it for a week and it's just been doing great and now it can't stand up and it's it's deficient vitamin E is a fat soluble vitamin and milk fat in that dough contains this but a lot of your milk replacers won't and that's where you'll see it when you're home raising one as opposed to some of those that are on the dose. Yes ma'am. If you don't have the Bozy, if you have one and you can't get to a bed to get the Bozy, you can take the vitamin E capsules of Coca Cola and squeeze them. <laughs> okay. You can take vitamin E capsules from Walgreens and squirt them in their mouth too. But that's uh and, and that's why we typically see it, or I saw it in practice, it was almost always somebody that was bottle feeding a goat and uh, they'd had it four or five days now, all of a sudden it, it'll nurse when I stick the bottle in its mouth, Doc, but it just can't stand up. And, and that's typically what you see. When that, ha when that happens, how soon are you to see progress? You mean when, when you supplement it? Once you supplement it, how long of a time period? About 48. 72 hours, two or three days of supplementing it, and then they'll be back up running around. How often would you supplement it? Um, the injections you just give one time. Uh, the oral product, um, I like to use Goat Nutri Drench. It's a product on the market, and if you look on the back of it, it has some really high levels of vitamin E and selenium. So that's my favorite oral thing, but uh, you know, to use in goats. Okay, pregnancy toxemia. They're going to talk about this in the nutrition portion. And I've only got about five more minutes, so we're not going to say a lot about it. But I had a guy yesterday, we were talking about body condition score, and he goes, well, can you get a goat too fat? A fat goat's where you're going to see this. Typically, this is going to be a boar show goat that's big old greasy Crisco fat. She stood in the pen her whole life and had grain poured out in front of her. And now she won at the county fair. And we're going to take her out here and breed her to this buck and get some really good, you know, uh, show weathers. And she's uh, a couch potato. She doesn't get much exercise. She's too fat. And they typically get this. Now, the other, the other way you'll see this is if you have a bunch of meat goat does and they're about three weeks from kidding in January and we have a northern blow in here and it rains on them for about a day and those goats will just start dropping in the pasture. The reason is because their blood glucose falls to about zero. They've got these triplets and twins in them that are utilizing all this glucose and they're out there eating and all of a sudden it, it blows in kind of cold and they're shivering and they get rained on and all of a sudden their blood glucose drops and those does can't recruit enough glucose. They're, they're almost like in a, a diabetic type coma type thing. So, and usually if you go out there and you'll give them some electrolytes, you can mix up the calf scour electrolytes, you can use Gatorade. Uh, Propylene glycol is a glucose precursor and you can drench them with that and in about 15 minutes they just stand up and walk off. Now you need to get them in and start feeding them good so that they can keep their blood glucose up. So that's the two scenarios we usually see. Either some goats that are a little thin, on pasture, heavy bred, going to kid in about two weeks and then you get this cold spell blow in or it's that fat show dough that we just had her too fat. 
And what happens in that shodo is once she's heavy bred, she's trying to send all this energy to those kids and she's metabolizing fat which produces ketone bodies and then you have low blood glucose and high ketones just like a diabetic again. What I like to do is I get a call from a producer and we've just had a cold spell blow in yesterday and it rained on them and they've got two does down in the pasture that are supposed to calve in two weeks doc and this is what it is. It's pregnancy toxemia and now they're not dead but they just feel terrible. I just have them get a thermos full of hot water and some uh, calf scour electrolytes uh, that you can buy at any feed store and you go out there and pour that down them and in about 15 minutes they'll stand up and walk back to the barn for you. Coccidiosis. Who in here's had a problem with that? Okay. Who in here's got coccidia? If you've got a goat, you've got coccidia. <laughs> Every goat walking this planet has coccidia. That doesn't mean they're showing clinical signs and it doesn't mean they're suffering from any kind of disease. But if you look at goat fecals enough, Almost every one of them will have some coccidia. Where we have a problem is when we stress this animal, and it's typically the young animal that's not got a lot of immunity, and then that coccidia has the opportunity to overpopulate and invade and, and infect this uh, kid. And it's usually when you wean them. Now it can be before that if you get some muddy, nasty conditions and it's rained and turned off cold, you can start to see some thin diarrhea in these, these kids and it can be coccidia. But usually it's when we pull them off the, their mothers and put them in a pen and they all stand there and think they're going to die because they don't get to nurse eight times a day now and uh, that's when we usually see it. Coccidia is real easy to treat. There's stuff you can put in the water, there's stuff you can put in their feed, there's medicine you can squirt down their mouth. It's not hard to get rid of, to take care of, but you're just not ever going to completely remove your goats from it. And there's several products that you can actually get in feed, commercial feed, that uh, Rumensin and, and Bovitec that's, that's labeled for goats for use in this. In the summertime when the weather's warm, I like to use the water treatment because they're drinking a lot. If it's in the really cold weather, I like to use it in the feed because they're going to eat more and, and they don't drink very much. Is this something that, that you should just... I'm not a big proponent of just normally doing uh, preventive medications. Mm -hmm. Is this something that you should do? Uh, I would only use these treatments if you have a problem. If you notice in here when I asked how many people had it, I only saw one hand go up. That means he's had enough clinical signs that he had to treat for it. The rest of you have it, you've just got good enough management and these kids haven't broke with it. So I wouldn't treat unless I had a problem. And the last thing I'll talk about is pink eye. I covered that yesterday a little bit when we were talking about some of the eye scores and that sort of thing. The reason pink, it's caused by uh, Moraxella ovus. That's the sheep pink eye organism. Moraxella bovis causes it in cattle. And it'll, if there's any cattle guys in here, ranchers, you'll see this is very similar. The only difference in sheep and goats is this guy here, chlamydia. We don't see much of a problem in cattle, but it sure causes a problem in sheep and goats. The other thing is, is that people get this. It's the number one infectious organism in sexually transmitted diseases in the United States. It also causes a bad conjunctivitis or eye infection in people. So if you went to the county fair and you come home and your goat's got his eyes watering and your, your, your children, kids are out there playing with them and then they start getting pink eye, this is what you've got. And your human physician will tell you how to treat your, your children, kids, but uh, your veterinarian, usually you can put some products, uh, medication in the eye, or my time-honored favorite is LA-200 under the skin, and it'll knock this chlamydia right out of them. The other thing is I like to use products and do things that are no-brainers to where you can't go wrong, and it doesn't matter whether you have Moraxella or chlamydia causing pink eye, LA-200 will, will take care of it. It's your drug of choice for this condition. But just be sure and wash your hands and use some good sanitation or gloves if you're treating this because you and your children can get it. Yes, ma'am. I think the withdrawal time on LA-200 is 45 days. Now, you need to check that and also that's a withdrawal time for cattle. You need to ask your veterinarian if you need to extend that to like maybe 50 or 60 days for goats. Is that something you can purchase off the shelf? Uh, you can buy it right over here at the farm store. Yes, ma'am.